All right. So a whole bunch of us went to Africa in January 2020. And so, oh, for crying out loud, why is she giving me a pro tip here? <laughs> That's really funny. Um, and we started off by flying from driving up to Chicago, Chicago to Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. to Ghana, and then Ghana to um, Johannesburg. So Accra, Ghana to Johannesburg. And uh, Johannesburg is um, locally called Joburg. And so it is the city of gold because gold was discovered there um, in the 1850s and the ton of people in 10 years. It went from, you know, a small town to 100,000 people by 1886. And so there are 11 official languages spoken in Johannesburg. Um, the most common, the, the most populous languages are Zulu and Xhosa, uh, but then Afrikaans is um, kind of the, the, the white Dutch leftovers um, is the third, and then of course English and uh, multiple uh, other ones. It is the cultural and economic hub <clears throat> of South Africa, and it is the largest city on the continent of Africa. Um, I didn't know until I um, asked our last guide of the trip, but Soweto is actually an acronym. It stands for the Southwestern Townships, um, that were the segregated parts of um, Johannesburg during apartheid. So we only spent one night in Johannesburg, so I don't have a lot of pictures of the, the town, um, but we did see, <clears throat> excuse me, at our hotel, we had amazing um, uh, foliage. So this is just out around the pool, and I just fell in love with those purple flowers and um, would like to see if they grow here, but of course they won't. Um, but again, lots of ferns and, and low growing like ground cover stuff. I made Sean stand next to those purple flowers just to show how tall they were. Um, they're just very beautiful. January in South Africa is um, their summer. So um, everything was lush. Um, the rains get ready to go. Um, this is, so we left Johannesburg, again, just one night in Johannesburg, and we flew to uh, Victoria Falls. And so this is us in the airport. If you are uh, fans of WTVP, you might have seen that in their magazine this month. <laughs> um, Zimbabwe is a country that has real challenges today. So the current president, Mungagwa, um, was elected in 2017 but he follows uh, Robert Mugabe. And Robert Mugabe took over first as prime minister when Zimbabwe declared its, or was actually recognized as independent in 1980. Um, he was technically elected president in 1907, or 1987 rather. And he served until he was forced out by the military in 2017. So, um, he, lots of complaints of corruption and um, poor mismanagement. One of the things that made him popular in the late 90s, um, he introduced a land redistribution campaign that um, took land from the white colonizers, essentially anybody white, even though your family might have lived on that land for generations, you were not native to South Africa. And so um, you could be stripped of your property and um, that property would be divided and turned over to um, black Zimbabweans. It, it has caused um, a, cr a collapse of the economy. So um, of course there was a lot of corruption and some of the um, land was given to Mugabe's friends who didn't know what to do with it. So, you know, it's, it's been wrecked. Um, it's been stripped of anything valuable. It hasn't been farmed very well. So there's a lot of hunger and there's a lot of um, the commodities that are typically grown in the agricultural areas um, are not turning up in Zimbabwe. When, uh, the challenge is, of course, though, that the current president, um, has adopted similar practices to Mugabe in the way that he deals with anybody who protests against him. Um, when we were in Zimbabwe, um, 
Sean and I mistakenly did in fact end up with some Zimbabwean dollars, um, but they're absolutely worth nothing. And so their economy is just really, really in the tank. If you wanna buy anything, you need to use um, the South African Rand um, or dollars, but, or euros if you have them, but certainly not the Zimbabwe dollars. Um, Angela, I have a $25 million uh, Zimbabwe yeah. bill. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we made a boo-boo, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll tell you about it in a second. The um, other major problem for Zimbabwe um, for a very, very long time, Mugabe denied um, the existence of AIDS, that, that it really wasn't an illness. And so um, they didn't take very aggressive steps to address it. And it spread incredibly far and wide. And so they have had excess mortality rates um, due to AIDS. Um, this is our bus driver. If you were on a different bus driver, you have a different guide, um, but his name is Reason. Um, who was your bus driver, Don and Cindy? Reason. Oh, he was Reason? How about you, Lee? I don't remember who it was. Yeah, um, they had really interesting names. Um, I think one was Honesty. <laughs> so, and I asked, you know, is that your real name or did you just, you know, <laughs> for us Americans, like, oh no, this is the name my mother gave me at birth. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, but he was very knowledgeable and very, very kind and uh, forthcoming about his country and about Victoria Falls and everything that's going on. He's the one who said, don't trade for Zimbabwe dollars. Um, Along the way from the airport to the Victoria Falls Lodge, um, there was an outdoor market, but it was raining and, and so nobody was there. As we approached the Safari Club, Reason starts talking about, you have to watch out for the sleeping policeman. And so, you know, of course we're like, are we gonna get a speeding ticket? What sleeping policeman? Uh, do you remember who the sleeping policemen are, Don? No. <laughs> the speed bumps. <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh they refer to this, the speed bumps as the sleeping policeman. Yeah, um, I the Imperium. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. so <laughs> Sean and I took a helicopter ride. We'll show you some of those pictures. We all enjoyed an, an amazing Boma dinner, and um, Sean and I also had a little fun on a nature trail. But this <laughs> is the safari um, lodge. So they've done the roof in, in very traditional style. This is actually two stories, but our um, room was on the, the ground floor, the first story. What was it? No, we were upstairs, weren't we? I think anyway. we traded to go upstairs. <laughs> oh yeah, we did trade yeah, so that we would do the stairs. The picture on the right is a totem that was out front of our mm -hmm. um, hotel rooms. Um, they had very interesting carvings all throughout the area. Um, mm -hmm. This place did have a really cool pool, but you should be careful about swimming in the pool. <laughs> On the right side of the pool, they had this really adorable um, carved crocodile, but a neat pool. It, it generated water up above and then flowed down below. Uh, one of the interesting things about this um, accommodation was feeding the buzzards. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, late morning, you'd start, or late afternoon, I should say, yeah, it was they fed them about three or something, but they would start to gather and you'd just see them coming and, and it would be a little freaky and they'd all be gathering on the ground. And I have a video, but this is a long enough presentation. So I didn't put the video in. So maybe a hundred more birds will show up. And then all of a sudden, one of the people from the safari club will go out with the scraps from the last few meals and put him out in the middle. Oh, you can see him down here. Actually, he is down here in, with his red um, cooler. Oh. And as soon as he opens the cooler, dumps it, and he walks away, and the birds just, <laughs> it's, it's like a scene out of Alfred Hitchcock. It's just crazy. <laughs> um, this is a living babo tree. Um, it was by the other part of the safari park where you go and buy souvenirs. And just to give the size, Sean's standing next to it. The vervet monkeys are everywhere. <laughs> and all of the signs on your windows say, lock your windows. You know, don't just shut the doors, but actually use the hook because they can open the doors and they can open your suitcases and they can root open through everything. Yeah, they open your mini bar and everything. So 
Um, and they not are, have driven away uh, yet, but they have seen them inside the car at the steering wheel. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So the, the local name for Victoria Falls translates as the smoke that thunders. And as we're going along the trails at Victoria Falls, um, our guide pointed out that Zambia owns this part of the Zambezi River. Um, the Zambezi River kind of flows between the two countries. Um, but here it, it juts and there's kind of a, a wide spot at the top that is technically part of Zambia, but Zimbabwe owns the view. <laughs> and so the, the river flows down and over the falls and you can't really see over the falls from Zambia. You have to see it from the Zimbabwe side. Um, our guide also pointed out that David Livingstone was not the person who discovered the falls, that there were people who lived there for centuries before he ever came along, but he was the first European to see it. Um, Zambia, again, was independent in 64. Zimbabwe wasn't recognized as independent until 80. Um, anybody want to take a stab what country they came from? Zambia and Zimbabwe? Rhodesia. Yeah, Rhodesia. Rhodesia. Yeah. Carolyn, you are muted, but I, I recognized your lips. <laughs> <laughs> I read your lips. Um, <laughs> the, the falls are not the largest falls in the world, um, but they are considered the um, the largest sheet of falling water because it stretches um, a mile wide and they plunge 360 feet deep. Um, because of climate change, there is some concern that the falls are being threatened and um, the heritage uh, sites, it's being questioned of whether this is a last chance destination. So if you haven't been there, this might be your last chance to see it before it dries up. Um, but it's just amazing wildlife. I mean, I just, I fell in love with the wildlife. It's just, just, I can't even begin to tell you how cool it is. Um, so the great cormorant here, there is a, a juvenile crocodile here and your Cory Bustard. They coexist quite peacefully. The crocodiles don't typically go after the birds because the birds just are faster, fly away. Um, the spray, you know, so there's a lot of drought and, um, you know, seasonal, regularly seasonal droughts in this part of Africa. Um, but it's also a rainforest and it's a rainforest not because of rain falling, but because of the spray that comes up from the falls. And so this is a pretty good picture of the, the end closest to the trail we were walking on. This is called Gorge One. Um, and you can see the spray as it shoots up. And it just, it creates, of course, beautiful um, uh, rainbows, but tropical rainforest. And it's, again, it's not because of the rain that falls down, but the spray that comes up from the falls. Um, this is Gorge One. In a good year <laughs> with good rains, this would be, you know, foliage to foliage. Um, it's still, you know, quite a bit of water and it's quite a bit of power, um, but there are, this is in the middle here, but there are whole stretches that are pretty dry. And so um, the falls are, are challenged right now. Um, there had been some rain before we arrived. And so, you know, so a lot of the falls still has water going down. Um, I put both of these pictures in because unlike the United States where we are risk averse and the lawyers are busy, you can go right up to the edge. <laughs> And there were people who went right up to the edge. I don't know, Don, Cindy, did you guys walk right up to the edge? No, no, I don't do that. <laughs> I stand behind people and then shove them, see what Yeah, happens. well, the day before we were there, somebody fell off and they had to close part of the trail because it was under investigation. Okay. Um, I don't like heights. And so this is probably 10 feet back from the edge. And then I held my camera out <laughs> the one over the edge, <laughs> but I didn't get any closer, but people would be like out on that point right here. I mean, just crazy close to the edge. Um, this bridge actually goes over the river and, and um, we're going to see it from the air in a minute, but this goes over what's called the second gorge. And then there's more bridges that connect other things. As we were on the trails, 
um, we caught our first spot of wildlife, <laughs> um, a, a bush buck there, and then um, the sh it's called a shaggy mane mushroom. I think it's poisonous though. Yeah. So again, Sean and I took a helicopter ride, and um, and so this is from the air. And just to tell you a funny story, quick, um, there were six of us that went on the helicopter. Anyway, six or eight of us anyway. Um, but <laughs> um, there were some that went first and then there were the four of us left. And as soon as we got off the van, the guy took a look at us and split us up. But then somebody from the, um, uh, from the tour company had to go with us because it had to be balanced in the, in the um, helicopter. So there had to be equal weight on either side of the helicopter. But the four of us that were left were too heavy to go four in the helicopter. <laughs> so Sean and I went in one helicopter and the other couple went in the other helicopter, which provided no end of fun because when they got out of their helicopter, she had flip-flops on and hit the tarmac. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I laugh when people do funny things. <laughs> I laugh my head off. Uh, but down here, <laughs> somewhere I would have ever done that. that. <laughs> Over here, yeah is called the devil's pool and so you have to get to it from the zambia side um, but people will wade out and sit right along the edge right now you can actually see there's a rim of rock so it's not quite as you know threatening but in a in a good year all of this would be full of water all of what you see you know edge to edge here would be a lake and um, you wouldn't be able to see those rocks. <laughs> It'd just be all flowing over the edge. And yet people make the trip out to the edge to sit in that devil's pool. So again, from the air, you can see the spray coming up um, and, and you can kind of get a glimpse of these darker zigzaggy. That's what the falls do. It cuts through, you know, so this is the current edge, but it's, it's cut through the basalt um, over the centuries, over the millennia. It just kind of zigzags all the way back. Um, they have built a power dam, a, a power facility to use the power of the water um, for the region, but you can also live there. <laughs> so these are actually either estates and or in some cases it's other resorts, but you can stay right on the edge <laughs> of the falls, um, not the water, the old falls. Um, and this is a golf course related to this uh, resort in Zambia. So lots of places to go. The other thing we did when we were at Victoria Falls, Sean and I anyway, we did this um, homestead trip. Again, the homesteads were part of Mugabe's land redistribution plan. Um, the, the last note here, <laughs> um, they may have multiple wives. Um, as our host told us, however, um, Having more than one wife is hard, <laughs> but as a cultural tradition, if something happens to your brother, for example, um, it is your obligation to take on his wife and children. Um, so, so you may choose to marry additional women, or you may end up with additional women. In the compound we went to, um, there was a brother, two brothers and a cousin, so three men, but between the three of them, there were probably, I don't know, a half a dozen wives and, and you know, another dozen kids. So um, this is, um, they stock up on the reeds for the roof. Um, this is not gonna keep the lions or the elephants out of their compound, but it will keep the, the goats in and kind of keep track of the kids and the chickens. <laughs> um, this is our fellow who lives in this compound um, sitting with us and, and just really sharing any information, any questions we had, he would answer. Um, this is a bathroom at their compound. Um, he, he said, you know, some really smart people from your country visited us and told us how to build a toilet. So they didn't like us going in the woods. So now we have a toilet and they have, you know, they collect rainwater to, you know, it's an outhouse type toilet, but they collect rainwater to flush it down and they save rainwater here to wash their hands. So this is just a look inside. 
And like dogs anywhere, find a nice cool spot in the sand. Um, the stools we are setting on are all hand carved, not necessarily by that particular um, homestead owner. Um, and if we could have figured out how to get one of those in our suitcase, yes. we'd have brought one home. Those are cool. Yeah. Um, but they raise a lot of chickens. And so this is, you know, the hen house kind of, you know, unobtrusive. But then when you peek inside, look at that big fat hen sitting on her eggs. Um, eggs are currency. They sell them. They trade them. Um, of course, they eat them. Um, but, but eggs are currency. So, um, and then, you know, this is like a, a bedroom, like, you know, one of their dwellings, the, the living place. And then um, side by side, inside it's pretty sparse. They put down the mattress at night when they go to sleep and then they put it up during the day to keep it cleaner. And then I took a picture of the rag rug at this next door place just because, you know, my mom and grandmother had rag rugs everywhere. So yeah. <laughs> um, their cooking hut is designed, you can see kind of there's a bench there. So the women can sit on the bench and take care of preparing the meals. Um, Sean's demonstrating duck <laughs> when you come out because, you know, I mean, we're not particularly overly tall, but you could bash your head pretty easily. And Lee, is this you or is this uh, Kurt Field? Uh, that's Kurt. That's Kurt. And I think he was asking the, the um, little girl about something and she went and got one to show him <laughs> so um this is a, a um what's her first name clocking um she used to live next door to us jane clocking so it was so funny when we showed up in africa i'm like oh my god you used to live next door to us <laughs> so the boma um is used to be or it technically means a livestock enclosure but it's come to be um, more commonly used as a community enclosure. And it's wherever the community gathers to make decisions for the community. And so we went and had fun. And so there's Lee right there and yep. Kurt Field. If you guys know Kurt Field, he's a hoot too. Um, so if you do these really fast, they're dancing. <laughs> so Sean really enjoyed the drumming. We all had to wear... Um, some some cloth so that we would fit in and this is half of our group and here's the other half of our group and um, tons of food all kinds of food and then the last morning we got up early and we went for a walk um, and took the nature trail um, this is a a what do you think six feet at an angle electrified fence that's what's keeping the elephants out of the Victoria Falls Safari, Safari Club um, and, um, we did a variety of things. So we walked down the hill and took a look at, uh, acacia trees. These are the trees that the giraffes particularly like to eat, but check out those thorns. <laughs> so, um, and they are sharp. Um, there was a bird blind at the bottom of the hill when we got down there. And this is the helmeted guinea fowl and they were all over the place and we ate them. So, um, this was a, a common staple and a butterfly too. Um, and as we were in the bird blind, Noah was down there and he had a rifle. <laughs> and so, you know, weren't sure if we were supposed to go talk to him or if he was hunting or what. And he said, oh no, come on, come on, come on. And so as he sat there, he was throwing out peanuts and he said, just give it a minute. <laughs> and sure enough, um, this, this little bush, bush buck um, started creeping up and then there were, you know, a half a dozen of them and then a dozen of them and they're all eating his peanuts. And he says, if you hold one out, the, the bush buck with the uh, notch in his ear will take it out of your hand. And so the bush buck came right up. And then <laughs> the family of warthogs came. Um, they're all females, but it's three generations. So this is the grandmother, and then the mother is a little bit smaller, and then this year's babies. But they're only girls. Um, they don't keep the boys around. As soon as the boys are weaned, they're on their own. Um, they are the ugliest thing and the cutest, cutest thing at the same time. And if you notice, they have to kneel down to eat because their necks don't bend. Um, in order for them to reach the ground, they have to, to, to kneel. Um, but I crouched down to take some pictures and the grandmother came right over and Noah said, 
don't feed her. She bites. <laughs> but this this isn't really like zoomed. She was that close. <laughs> so um, but that's his his little pellet gun. It's not really gonna like kill a lion or anything. What it does is it makes a loud noise to keep the vervet monkeys at bay. So um, his job is to sit down there and you know keep the monkeys away. Well and, at at dinner time they had guys placed around oh, yeah. the the all the different lodges we were at. They had guys placed where you couldn't see them with rifles poking at the monkeys to keep them away. Otherwise they'd raid the the meal time, which was out in the open. So yeah, because all of the buffets were all open air. So mm -hmm. you know they could just come right in. But but his little rifle is just to make noise. So then we went to Botswana. Um, again, also had been part of Rhodesia and the Union of South Africa. Um, it is one of Africa's um, most safe, um, progressive, economically solid government has been civilian without any, you know, civil war or, or military takeover or anything like that since its uh, independence. So they have invested very heavily in their tourism, ecotourism in particular, and it, it was the first place we saw elephants and it was just amazing. Other things that they've done correctly though, or, or progressively is to deal with their AIDS um, outbreak as well. They have very comprehensive, you know, ads on the TV, billboards, um, all kinds of activities to try to get to, um, to, to reduce deaths due to um, HIV AIDS. Um, so these are the things we'll talk about here. Um, the funniest thing about the, the Chobe Bush Lodge was <laughs> whether or not you'd have water. <laughs> and so, and, and I mean this in your room. So um, if you had water, it was likely very cold, <laughs> but sometimes you didn't have any water at all. So then you just didn't take a shower. <laughs> so, um, but uh, the other funny part about it was we, we did both land and river safaris at Chobe, um, but uh, you had to be out of the park at 6 p.m. Um, Lee or Don, whoever else was there, do you remember why we had to be out of the park by 6 p.m.? No. Because that, that's when, do you remember Lee? Was that when the lions come? Um, not the lions, almost as bad, but um, the military comes in. Oh, the military, yeah. The oh. military is hunting poachers. <laughs> so oh, that's right. Uh, that's Botswana right. Botswana has that's a right. huge population of elephants. And so the military patrols the parks at night in an effort to keep the poachers down. Um, there were a gazillion impala everywhere, yeah. um, but I still thought they were the cutest little things. So they're called the McDonald's of the savannah because on their butt, their the black markings make like an M shape, <laughs> and the lions eat them up literally. <laughs> so um, lots of baboons in Chobe Park, and we're flying through the park, and the tree on the the left, you know, we pass it. And he slams on the brake and he backs up and um, his spotter is pointing up at the tree and his spotter sees this tiny little bush squirrel up on the edge of this tree. So just amazing. So they, they can see everything, I swear. They ate a lot of carrots. They ate a lot of carrots, yes. Um, we did, on our first trail, um, come across a lioness who was enjoying her... Um, Impala. <laughs> and I didn't video tape it, but I should have. But it was so loud to hear her crunch, crunch, crunching the bones. It was just amazing. <laughs> um, the marabou stork uh, is very common. See it all over the place. The southern ground uh, hornbill, however, um, we only saw those at Chobe. So um, not as, as common. And um, the guy who drove us around Chobe really liked birds. And so we saw a lot of birds. This was the first elephant we saw, and I was so excited, um, but certainly not the last. These two are actually male lions we saw on the second time around um, that were, you know, having a little snooze in the bushes. Um, 
And then again, we saw a lot of birds. So the African wattled lapwing there and the Cory Bustard. Um, somewhat frequently see those. Um, hippopotami are, are pretty cool. So when we took our river safari, um, we came across this pod of hippopotamus. And when they're trying to make you go away is when they open their mouth and yawn. So it's not because they're sleepy and they need to take a big breath of air for coming up under the water. Um, they're trying to scare away a threat. Um, and this is what the guy looks like on ground. <laughs> so he is one big fellow, um, a little crown plover there. Um, I was taking pictures of the lily pads because they were just so adorable. And Sean pokes me and says, that's not a lily pad. <laughs> it's a crocodile. <laughs> so, um, so the lily pad was like, you know, right six o'clock from here. And um, that guy's just all over the place. These are water buck and they're distinguished by their, their white circle on their butt. Um, they really like the grasslands around the water and they will jump into the water to get away from predators, which is sometimes dangerous because if it's a crocodile predator, a <laughs> they, yeah, they've just jumped on the table of the croc. Um, Angela, yeah. did, I think we had a different uh, guy than you, but he said on those animals, those were the first ones that Noah put on the ark. And uh, the reason you know is, is the bathroom was freshly painted. Oh. <laughs> sure enough. <laughs> took me a while to catch that one. <laughs> yep. All right. And that's a female. Um, actually, that's a different animal. I didn't notice her horns. I should have looked her up. Um, the, the water buck have... Um, it could be a baby male, it could be a young male, but the water buck have um, real long, just a slight spiral um, on, their, on their horns. The crocodile, again, we saw a number of crocodile along the Chobe River. And our guide, this is his favorite bird, and it's really hard to spot, this lilac-breasted roller, but it is a pretty bird. And once he pointed it out, we were looking for it everywhere. And so these are actually two different locations for this lilac breasted roller, but um, just a pretty little bird. And then um, we came across a big herd of elephants. So the river safari is over here. That's actually like a, a river boat, like home. Um, but then, so we're on the land now and we came across these guys and I tried to do this so that you would have perspective of how close we are. So this whole herd of elephants is catching a little mud and water and there's a little baby that they're tending and taking care of. And then while we're all looking at this herd on the left side, I hear rustling. So I look over and here's this huge bull coming through the trees. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's intent and it comes right along behind um, the, the van we're in and starts moving the herd like enough dilly dally in here, it's time to get going. And he went down and he rounded up um, all of the elephants. And there were a couple of elephants that didn't seem ready to leave the mud and looked like they were gonna have a little bit of a fight, but he was much bigger and, and pushed them right along. So um, there are a lot Before of- Before you leave the elephants, the funny story there was as they were coming past the Jeep, the baby elephant was rock, walking right toward the Jeep and the, the driver was, was kind of watching. He quickly backed the Jeep up to give a, a bunch of room for the baby elephant because he said what'll happen is the elephants won't push the baby around. They'll just come up and push the Jeep out of the way so it's not too close to the baby. So he was backing up so the elephant didn't come push on the Jeep. Yeah. Because he said they won't, they won't steer the baby. They'll just move everything else out of its way. <laughs> Which would be us. And when we were there, he did, um, our guides, all of our guides always said, don't put your seatbelts on because if I tell you, you have to get out of the Jeep, you have to get out of the Jeep. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, lots of baboons. Um, I didn't see any up close. And then there's like these weird animals that every now and then we'd come across them. <laughs> so if you had to use the bathroom on a drive, every now and then they would just stop right? And, and you got out <laughs> and you walked into the bush and you took care of business. 
I was careful to never need to use the bathroom. I think you did once. It's probably easier for guys than it is for girls, but um, that was not going to be, I was not going to be anybody's lunch. Um, <laughs> Angela, those are, uh, many people call those the most dangerous animals in the world. They are. They really are. <laughs> Next to the baboons. <laughs> <laughs> the baboons, right. And we're almost as bad. Um, you know, but these guys are just laying on the road. You can see where He's the tire tracks are. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, they were they were cute, but pesky. Again, another big elephant. Um, and then we saw our first Cape Buffalo. This is not the best picture. There's gonna be some other ones, but these are the first ones that kind of popped out of the tree right next to the van and surprised us. Um, this is a marabou stork that has something wrong with it. And so I took that picture too. Um, but this is also an elephant that um, was poached in this Chobe Bush or Chobe River Park. And um, the poachers, once they took what they wanted, they burned it to try to get rid of the evidence. Um, mm -hmm. Again, the Chobe River area, Botswana, has the most elephants of all parts of Africa. So it was just, it was amazing to watch the elephants. I mean, just so many of them. Oh, and by the way, this little berm here will turn out to be their bed at night. They don't really lay down on the ground because they're so huge. So they'll find like a berm and then just lean against it for, the, for their sleep. So um, this is at the entrance where they just collected skulls of all the animals that, you know, full skulls. Um, this is the mailbox at the Chobe River Lodge. We're still waiting for our mail that I put in there. <laughs> Someday somebody's gonna look in there and say, huh, I bet they wanted these sent. Cause we did go to the post office. We'll, we'll tell you a quick story about the post story. office. You wanna? I can tell the most yeah. story. Go ahead. You got a picture of it? I don't. We didn't take any pictures of the oh, okay. post office. Yeah, so we, we wanted to get postage so we could mail letters. And so we, we were right by the town. So we walked down into the town and we we're looking for the post office. And the post office was not very well marked. And so we were apparently standing there looking like dumb tourists because a, a guy walked up to us and asked if we needed help. And of course we did. And <laughs> We told him the post office said, well, this is it. It's that building right there. We just didn't realize it. So we went into the post office and I, I wish we had a picture of it because it was truly amazing. Unlike the U.S. post office, in this post office, you could buy insurance, you know, life insurance, um, death insurance, uh, all kinds of insurance products for sale. You could buy cell phones. Um, they covered family planning in there. Um, they covered, you know, important health bulletins about AIDS and HIV, uh, money orders, you know, sending, receiving money. I mean, you name it, it was, it was all in the post office on top of stamps and everything else. And so we went in there and they had, they had rows of chairs. So you could like sit down and wait your turn because it was one clerk. And we went in and there was one lady in front of us. And so we sat down thinking, oh, that's what we're supposed to do. And behind us came another lady who was, you know, obviously a native dressed traditionally. And <laughs> She opened the door and came in and looked at us like we had three heads. And she walked carefully walked around us and sat down next to the, the other lady that was in there and proceeded to talk in, you know, whatever native language, right? And, and you, you could tell, we couldn't understand what she said, but you could tell she was saying something to the tune of, what are these dumb white idiots doing in our post office? <laughs> you know, so, and they were super polite to us, but it, it did give us a chuckle, you know, because you, you really... It's a great opportunity to feel like more of an outsider when you go somewhere else like that, right? And certainly this lady just couldn't believe that we would be in her post office. Uh, I guess apparently most tourists don't go there, but it was a lot of fun. And the post office was very cool uh, just to see everything they did there. One stop shop for most of your stuff. So, yeah. The picture on the right is a small termite hill with a tree growing out of it, which is typical. The termites will drag the seeds down into, the, into their. Um, mound and so plants grow out of the top. So then after Botswana we cross the river into Zambia briefly. We kind of are on our way to the airport from um, the Chobe River Lodge to um, Kruger where we went to Kapama. Mm -hmm. We had to get on the plane in Zambia. Um, mm -hmm. Zambia is um, not as well off as Botswana but much better off than Zimbabwe. <laughs> so um, in any case, though, the big excitement in Zambia 
was we had to get across the river and they have this beautiful new bridge that um, our guide said the Koreans are building, but I'm thinking it's part of the Belt and Road Initiative. So it's probably- uh, No, it, it, I actually looked it up because it's open now. It was South Korea. Was it really? Good, it I'm glad to hear that. But they had trucks lined up. So unless you're carrying fruit, <laughs> you get in line and you walk up and you go fill out the papers and you wait your turn to cross the river because they take one or two trucks at a time on these barges going back and forth across mm -hmm. the river. So you can wait for like 10 days, two weeks. Um, oh, you know, goodness. people have kind of set up bathrooms and shower facilities and, and, you know, but in each direction, it was just wall to wall trucks. And so this is the, um, the, the kind of, um, that's the barge. Ferry, the barge that takes yeah, you across the, the river. The barge, truck it's barge. not very far. And there's that beautiful new bridge, just not open at that time. Um, so we asked Chet um, <laughs> what he thought. So we're down here over on the right waiting for our little, um, you know, what? A little motorboat. Our, yeah, our little <laughs> motorboat to take us a few at a time. Because again, you know, we're big Americans. And so we can't all get on the little boat. We can only take a few at a time. So I said, you know, we'll go on the barge because they were putting people next to the trucks. And so at first he's like, no, 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 we got to stay together. We got to stay together. And then he realized how long we were going to be sitting there waiting to cross the river. And he's like, oh, you guys can go. So we walked over and after they loaded the trucks, we got on with all the other people who got on. And this is us with the tanker going across the river. Um, the funny part was I, I told you about the, the money. Um, so a guy comes up to us and I don't understand what he's saying, but he's, you know, mostly money. So I pulled out our, our money and I gave him whatever 10, um, which is like a dollar or something. Right. And he gave me some Zimbabwe, he gave me 10 Zimbabwe dollars back. And I'm like, I think we just traded money. And then 10 minutes later, a guy with tickets comes by and says, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I mean, again, <laughs> again, they saw the white dumb people coming. <laughs> right? but, it was, but I got it. Is this your only boat pictures? You got well, this one is, more. No, this is it. We went over. You went back that one. Yeah, go back one, one more too. So that boat, when you see that boat, that looks reasonably safe. You'll notice the deck <laughs> of the boat is actually above the waterline. Angel and I walked down and got on a boat and apparently the truck was a lot heavier and then a lot of people got on. So by the time it pushed off from shore, the deck of the boat was about an inch underwater. And that you see that blue cab thing sticking up right mm -hmm. there. That's who's driving the boat and it's on a post and it's bent. And then there's a bunch of pieces of, of welded steel scabbed onto it to hold it up so it doesn't fall in the river. And so once we got on the boat and recognized that it was kind of more of a death trap i was slightly more nervous about going across the river not because we couldn't swim but because the river is full of crocodiles so it you know reduces your chances of making it i guess i only did. had to outswim angela and we'd be okay that's right, right that's right but yeah well, we once we got on the boat it was it was it was less romantic this is us on the boat thinking like what are we doing yeah. and see you won't get that experience anymore because the bridge is open and that's, that's right. right yeah we and most uh, those small bridge. businesses along there they don't have business anymore yeah well, yep. this is we got off and walked up the ramp and then turned around and took a picture of our boat and you can kind of see where the, the the tower is leaning but nobody talked to us nobody paid us any yeah. attention we, versus the speedboat that brought the rest of the yeah. crowd is immediately assailed by <laughs> the souvenir hawkers yeah we were fine <laughs> it was the same well it's the same deal we we went across where the natives cross right and so we got off of that boat and all the natives were looking at us like, what the hell are they doing on that boat? Right? <laughs> it was the same, it was the same reaction. Yeah. Like you people are in the wrong place. So. And so um, uh, Chet had to go in and, and pay our fee to cross the border, even though we were only in Zambia for, you know, an hour, <laughs> we had to pay, um, I, uh, is Chet on here? It was 50 or $70 a person. I can't remember. It was um, 50. Yeah, but he had our passports and he had the cash and, you know, hands them to the guy and the guy tells him it's X amount of money and they counted it and he says, oh, you're $1,200 short, <laughs> which is like half, right? 50%. And then um, he's like, no, no, 
<laughs> so you give me back the money and he counts it again and and eventually it was fine and, and we crossed the border so mm. we went through the gates there and and went into Zambia to the airport um, it was interesting though because along the way um, there were a lot of different you know styles of homes and stuff so this is you know another one of the homestead type homes and then we went into the town. Um, this is the Stanley house, you know, um, Stanley went and looked for Dr. Livingstone because nobody had heard from him for, I don't know how long. Um, the whole story about Dr. Livingstone, I presume, is anecdotal, um, but the odds are that Dr. Livingstone smelled like the natives <laughs> and, um, or didn't look like Dr. Livingstone and so, Stanley wasn't sure if it was him. <laughs> so anyway, one of the oldest churches. We stopped briefly at Perry's Bridge because our rooms weren't available at Kapama yet. So when we landed in, in Perry's Bridge, um, the um, at Kruger rather, um, this was a neat sign that they had about with the rhinos and the elephants alive and free. Um, and then of course, the, the uh, electrified fence to keep the alive and free out of the airport. <laughs> but the drive to Perry's Bridge was amazing. Again, it was, you know, groves of avocados and limes and, and macadamias and what have you. Um, but understand that to get to that, they have to clear cut forests. <laughs> and, um, and this is the after the clear cutting and they've planted the rows of bushes um, these are the guys who are out there cutting down the trees um, to plant the rows of, of crops. So, you know, win some, lose some. Um, our hotel at Perry's Bridge was really, really nice. It had an indoor bathroom and an outdoor bathroom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you could shower outside if you wanted to. Nobody could see you. I mean, there's, there's walls, but it was just kind of interesting. <laughs> and then again, those crazy nutty people, um, before dinner, we went over and had some drinks. And this is Sean's dinner. It was some kind of a seafood gumbo <laughs> with a big, big <laughs> shrimp in there. Um, along the way, again, some nice houses, some what you would expect of, you know, village type housing, and then some really nice housing. So uh, with the enclosed gates, um, our bus did get stopped <laughs> and inspected and he had to pay a fine because he didn't know where the fire extinguisher was. We had one, but he didn't know where it was. And so he had to pay a fine because he couldn't identify it right away. Um, but while we're waiting, so was everybody else. Everybody was getting stopped for these, you know, spot inspections, including the burial society and the gals in front of us in their pickup. <laughs> so um, it was a fun place to stay. Um, Kapama was out of this world in, in terms of a nice place to stay. Um, I have never been any place, and it's not that old, really. Um, the, the lodge itself that we stayed in is only um, finished in 2006. So um, Kapama is the name given to the Shangan chiefs. Um, if they were good enough chiefs, chiefs, they would be reborn as lions. And that's the word that, that means, um, that's what Kapama means, is the Shangan, Shangan chief reborn as a lion. Um, it had, a multi, it had um, tons of space. So um, it has forests, it has savanna, um, it had its own airport. I, I just read um, that they've reopened that little private airport where we stopped and had tea one day. Um, mm -hmm. It's now reopened. Um, but they also have like an elephant experience area and they had this endangered species area. And so, um, but what they also had was every kind of animal you could possibly want to see in Africa. So they had wildebeests, and they had rhinos. These are white rhinos, not the black rhinos. Um, some people did, when we were at Chobe, go on a private reserve drive, and they saw the last of the black rhinos, um, mm. and it doesn't have anything to do with the color of their skin. I'm not sure. 
why they're named black, but these are just white rhinos um, that are out and about at Kapama. It's a private game preserve. Um, and like all big animals like that, they wallow in the mud. Um, the giraffes really, I could have watched the giraffes forever. I mean, next to the elephants, the giraffes were really, they were cute, <laughs> they were fun. Um, and I waited a long time for that one to turn to me so I could take a picture. <laughs> um, the big pile of poop on the left is the honeymoon suite. <laughs> and so the dung beetle will stick his bride in a pile of poo and roll it up really nice and tight and then move it down the road to somewhere safe until she, you know, has her babies and then they feed on the poo and then there's more dung beetles. <laughs> so, um, so the, the elephant poop is particularly a favorite of the dung beetles. Um, the giraffe, you know, these are just the first ones we saw, but it's easy to understand why they hang out in a group for safety because you can't really tell how many there are. Um, and then the Cape Buffalo, um, we came across this big herd. Uh, I, I have a video also of, the, of a couple of them, you know, going at it um, where their horns lock actually. And then they're like fighting against each other to pull each other apart. Um, but they are um, interesting creatures. Um, and we passed this guy. So I'm gonna go fast through the next three slides. So it looks like a video. Um, but he is in right off the road, there's this patch of water and he is giving a big yawn, but not for us. This water buffalo is sitting right on the edge of his water pond and not at all nervous. <laughs> so um, the, the big five, as they're called, um, are not, the, they're not all carnivores. So they're big. Um, the Cape buffalo is one of them. The hippopotamus is the second, the rhinoceros, the lion, and the elephant. And the reason they're called the big five is because they're the only animals that will turn and attack you. More people are killed by the grass-eating hippopotamus every year than by, you know, the lions. So, um, but the big five um, will turn and fight. And so um, the head-to-head -head between a hippopotamus and a Cape buffalo, mo both of them are mostly grass eaters, but they just don't like each other. We happen to see the black-backed jackal. Um, I think our van might have been the only group that saw them. Um, they just look cute little dogs. Um, but <laughs> Harry, our driver there, slammed on the brakes and said, oh my god, I haven't seen those in, in months. So um, we were pretty excited. Come on, there we go. On our night at Kapama, we went out at night and um, the guy who would sit up on the chair um, was the guide. Yeah, was the guy. Yeah. So we had the driver and we have a guide and he would shine his flashlight and look for eyes reflecting in the light. So we saw a variety of animals at night as well. <clears throat> There's another one of those, um, <laughs> the toilet seat um, water box. And there is, um, he turned just as we were pulling up and I asked Harry, I said, he looks kind of angry. Should we worry? He goes, oh, we'll just move on. <laughs> so, uh -huh. Look at those horns. <coughs> Can you imagine? So um, this is actually a warthog um, skeleton that we stopped and looked at. You guys might know Kathleen. Um, a leopard tortoise. Those things move faster than you think. It was in the middle of the road and then it was in the bushes and I went chasing after that. Again, the giraffes really make me happy. Um, and then um, rhinoceros in the wild, you just come up upon them and, and you know, I mean, they're not close enough to touch, but they're, you know, <laughs> 20 feet away. It was really neat. It was really neat. Keep your hands and feet inside the van at all times. <laughs> so um, the animals get used to the van. And so, you know, they more or less just ignore it. But if you got out of the van, you'd be in trouble. Um, we'll come up to some lions here in a second. But a water, water monitor along the waterway there. So 
um, some of us went on a, a nature walk. I think Lee, I think you yeah, also I did, went on yes. a nature walk. Yeah, and so your guide takes you. So Harry on the left is our guide, and then Eben is on the right, goes with a rifle. It's only a 375, <laughs> but nonetheless, um, it's enough to scare an animal away, and then you're supposed to run. <laughs> and so, um, you know, he looks like he's like 12 years old, but he's, you know, married with kids. He's, I don't know, late 20s or something. I found a cool shell and Harry was explaining that probably a bird had brought it from somewhere and dumped it there. He also knew a great deal about the termites and that under where we're standing was probably like a huge colony of termites because you'll find these holes that, that indicate that. Um, he's got a dung beetle ball and I can't remember who else's poop. The yellow flower on the left, I could not find a name for it but they call it bush soap. And when you make it wet, you rub it between your hands, it actually makes like dish soap. And so it's real slimy and it smells real good, <laughs> but I couldn't find it. Um, I looked and looked for the name of it, but I couldn't find it. But it's some kind of fern you can tell. But anyway, it was pretty cool. Um, this is a kudu um, and note the, the curly Q horns. Um, this is a male, only the males have horns for the kudu. Um, and there's a lion all by himself. And, and I think I didn't maybe, um, again, maybe 20 feet away is all. Um, and as we passed by, he rolled over and went back to sleep. <laughs> <So> <laughs> completely unconcerned. Um, he did have one missing eye and our guide explained that he's probably been kicked out of the pride um, because he's too old and hurt. Mm -hmm. um, again, in the Savannah part, each day we had different places in the park where we drove. And so um, we saw different animals on every day. Um, a couple of rhinos. Uh, the jackals are not meat eaters necessarily. They will eat meat, but they are scavengers. And so when the jackals showed up, I was really afraid for that poor giraffe. And our guide's like, oh no, they're going for the bones. And so that's exactly what they did. All of the animals come to this boneyard. So all of the, like the food you eat, whatever at this park is dumped in this trench and animals just show up because they all need the calcium from the bones. Um, and so they'll all, you know, root around for a while. Um, when we were there, the ant, we were sitting in the van and this mama uh, rhinoceros and her baby came out of the woods and all of a sudden the rhinoceros takes off running and comes up really close to the van. And as it gets close to the van, it kind of stops and snorts and then backs off. And then the mom comes up, she's not running, but she comes a whole lot closer and then she snorts and backs up. And after they left, because I'm thinking, oh my God, they're gonna push us over. <laughs> and after they walked away, the guide said, they can smell your perfume. Don't wear perfume tomorrow. And it wasn't me because I don't wear perfume, but I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so, and the, the hyenas came up right behind us and were sniffing at the basket of what we have for tea and snacks and stuff. Um, we followed that guy for a while, another blue wildebeest. And then we went to the Endangered Species Center and Sean's telling me I'm taking too long, sorry. Um, this guy is injured. It's actually, I think it's a female, isn't it? I don't know, but in any case, no, though, this was a male because he is trying oh, yeah. to attract all the people with his yeah. with his peace offerings there. Yeah, he's trying to get a mate. So the vans will pull up with people, and he brings you this trash, hoping to attract a mate. <laughs> um, unfortunately, nobody would like his trash, um, and he is injured, so he's going to be there forever. But they too fed the buzzards, and the reason that they're uh, feeding the vultures rather. Um, so these are the white cowl um, vultures, and then you can see some of the, the marabou stork in there. But the vultures are actually an endangered species. So you wouldn't think that necessarily because, you know, there's a lot of dead stuff they can scavenge, except that um, there's also been a lot of pesticides and that sort of thing used, um, which has hurt their eggs and hurt their, their mm -hmm. offspring. And so they're an endangered species. So they're being taken care of at the um, Endangered Species Center as well. And that's why at the first place we're at, Victoria Falls, they also feed the, the vultures. Um, at this endangered species place, 
the guy with the horn is owned by somebody, but he's being taken care of by the endangered species place until he gets big enough. Um, and then he'll probably be part of a, a game hunt. So, um, you know, I, I suppose everything has to come around and go around. Um, the Zika on the left, the female zebra, was actually hand raised on a farm. Um, and then they couldn't keep her. So they gave her to the endangered species and they would like to breed her and then put her back out in the wild. But she is so tame, she would come right up to the van. So they've given her, um, they call him lover boy and he tries to make up with her and, you know, and she bites him and kicks him and has nothing to do with him. Um, a couple of brothers, they've named Scar and Mufasa. Um, they have a sway back and so they can't be released. They would, they would not be able to fend off attacks. And so these two guys live together. They wrestle and they fight around and stuff. Um, this is the only place that we saw, at least our group saw antelope, these sable antelope. Mm -hmm. They are really, really pretty. Um, and um, again, they're, they're big game animals and you can see where they're tagged that they're owned by somebody. Um, but they're being, you know, raised and fattened up at this endangered species center. Um, this is a leopard. The cheetahs have the, the black lines that look like, you know, black tears from mascara or something. Um, this is the only leopard they have. And ironically, our, as our guide pointed out, it's the only animal they know who will go to the bathroom in their own drinking pool. <laughs> and that's what she's doing. <laughs> so... Um, but they do, they are carefully breeding cheetahs. They're trying to repopulate the <laughs> cheetahs. So all of the cheetahs have chips and they put um, a female in one run and then they'll put two males on either side and let her pick. And if neither of those males appeals, they get some other males in there. But they're making sure that the, um, the, the DNA is diverse enough um, because that's a threat to cheetahs in the wild. Um, these guys, this pride, uh, on the way back from the endangered species um, camp, um, uh, our guide got a radio call about a pride of lions that was right next to the road. So you can see down here in the bottom left corner, that's our Jeep. That's how close they are. <laughs> so, but they don't care. They just look and again, keep your hands and feet inside the car at all times. <laughs> so when we were leaving, another van pulled up and a kid dropped his cell phone and he went to stand up and get it. And the guide in the other van said, don't you move. And the kid's like, well, I gotta get my cell phone. He goes, don't you move. And he's keeping an eye because all of a sudden the lions all looked at them in the van and he backed up his van opened his own door and reached down and grabbed the cell phone. And he said, I'll give it back to you when we get back to camp. <laughs> but you just don't mess with <laughs> um, the, the lions, especially, right? Oh, this is the guy who's missing the eye. So he's retired, they said. Um, and he just hangs out by himself. So Angela, yeah. our guide said that uh, he was attacked by his sons. Oh, yeah. And um, so his sons have, they've each got their own prize, but they did run him off. Uh, our first night out, we came across him as he was looking for the one he had reestablished. And we got to hear him growl. Uh, I mean, talk about a roar of a lion. Uh, cool. I just am so mad that I didn't record it. Uh, yeah. It, yeah, it was, I wish I had recorded the, the lion eating that impala because it was so loud. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Reasons to go back, right? Mm -hmm. And this, this gal is in the wild herself. I mean, she's hiding out in the bushes. I don't know how the guides see those things. But of course, when they see them, then they point them out and we can see them too. Well, um, one, one eye was coming down the road because uh, I've got some great shots. And um, as he got closer... Then um, the cheetah raised up oh. and because we were parked to the side and watched and then it got close enough that it took off. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So again, every day we'd stop and have, well, you could have beer and wine and 
tea and coffee and, and whatever. Um, but um, this is at the old airfield that they've now opened again. But, you know, you're just standing there. There's, you know, wildebeest back there and there's impala. And, you know, over here, there'll be zebras. And they're like, oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> like, okay. Oh, yeah, there you go. There they are. <laughs> so they're just watching us because we're weird. Um, this is a Ni uh, Nyala. And um, not particularly rare, but I thought very, very beautiful. And this is actually on the run. So that's why it's a little bit blurry because she was moving. Maybe a he, actually, it's probably he with those horns. Um, but, but the female actually don't have horns, yeah. So this is a female Nyala, um, but really neat antelope. Um, the masked weaver birds live here. Um, another uh, thing to have videotaped were the go away birds. They're actually called go away birds because their call is, sounds like they're saying, go away, go away. <laughs> So anyway, this was another pride that we kind of saw leaving as we were uh, approaching. And then the giraffe seemed like they were coming to say hello and then they turned off um, right as, as they got up toward us. Um, on the left, our guide wasn't sure if it was a, a eagle, what they call it, a brown eagle, something like that. Um, I think it looks more like a buzzard, but I don't know. So. Um, but again, lots of cool birds. Um, another uh, cheetah back there in the in the woods, just hanging out, probably having just eaten something. Um, a lion. There's a few cubs around here too. I had to get this guy. Yeah, <laughs> we had a little right. gecko um, okay. who who was just on the road, and and you know how they they move in a jerky way. He was fun to watch. Um, and again, <laughs> impala everywhere but I can't get tired of seeing them. And there's your, you know, toilet bowl, but. <laughs> or bullseye. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but neat, that's a female, obviously. So, and this is <laughs> at Kapama. It's one of the art pieces that were there. Um, and this guy's alive at Kapama, one of the dung beetles that's just kind of wandering around in the bathroom, actually. He was on the sink in the bathroom. So I just <laughs> took those pictures. Um, the last place we went to, and boy, we're really running out of time, was Cape Town. And so Cape Town um, is old. It was established first. Well, I mean, I'm sure there were Native people who lived there always, but it was colonized by the Dutch in the 1650s um, by the, the United East India Company. Um, and then, you know, in the 1800s, there were some back and forth between the British and the Dutch. Ultimately, the Boyer Wars. Um, were won by the British. And so the, the British took over from the early 1900s. Um, it's a huge sprawling city. It's a cultural center, economic center, um, beautiful bay, you know, beautiful views of the cold down south. Um, you know, you can't see Antarctica, but nonetheless, you know, it's down there. Um, it was deeply affected by the elections in South Africa in 1948 when the National Party won and they ran on a platform of apartheid, of segregation. Um, we're going to come back and talk about District 6 here in a little bit, um, but it was ultimately all cleared by 1965, 1966 um, in order to make it a white area only. Um, since the end of apartheid, Cape Town has sprung back, um, maybe not overnight because they have a lot of immigrants who come to Cape Town because there is so much economic opportunity. Um, but um, when we arrived in Cape Town, it felt a little bit like home. <laughs> so all of the buses had um, Caterpillar advertising on them. <laughs> so um, so uh, in spite of the fact that, you know, it's, it's not an apartheid system anymore. They do still have prisons. And so one of the big prisons in South Africa is outside of Cape Town. Um, there are also a lot of slums along the way because as I said, there's a lot of immigrants who come to Cape Town for the economic opportunity and there's not necessarily housing for them. So they slap up something somewhere. Um, some of them have satellite dishes. <laughs> so, um, but our guide, 
um, was pretty interesting. She had been an organizer, a community organizer. And in the days of apartheid, she'd been arrested. She had, you know, um, stood shoulder to shoulder with, with the, the people of color of all sorts. And the categories of color in South Africa are of all sorts. So there's white people, white people, white people. But then there's coloreds. And coloreds are a wide variety of perhaps mixed race. Maybe they're the Indians because a lot of Indians emigrated to um, Cape Town, in South Africa because of the trade. Um, some of the slave trade came from um, Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, so okay. they call them the Cape Malays. Um, so they're not African black, but they're colored and colored with a capital C is actually what they're referred to. And then there are the, the Africans, the African people, um, the, the black people. Um, and so the slums are a wide variety of all of them. And our guide, you know, told us a lot about the cool stuff around Cape Town and South Africa in general, but she also told us about the real stuff too. And so um, the day we arrived was a beautiful day. So we were able to take the Peninsula Drive, um, which is only if it's a beautiful day because you, you really travel right along <laughs> the side of the rocks. Um, but we were able to do that. And um, so there's some outposts, as you can probably guess, Cape Town had to defend itself um, that looks out across uh, the false bay goes to the right. And then of course the, and the ocean there, um, the Indian and the, um, what would it be? The Atlantic? The Atlantic. Bay? Yeah, the Indian and the Atlantic meet down there. Um, and this is Cape Town proper over there, all of that um, development. We stopped and went to the lighthouse. And when you get up to the top of the lighthouse, the wind is incredible. <laughs> um, so, you know, take off your hat, um, hold on to your sunglasses. <laughs> And, and I, I don't remember how many miles an hour it's blowing, but it was really blowing hard. And you had to walk up. There wasn't like an elevator to take you up there. There was an elevator that took you most of the way, but then you had to walk up the steps the rest of the way. It, it took um, every pound of weight that I have on me to hold me down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was really, really blowing. Um, and then along the road are just ostriches out and about. And so this is a female... Um, and these are the males and, you know, they're just common ostriches that just kind of hang out in the dunes. Um, farms, this is what a traditional farm in the region would look like. Um, and then this is a more, let's see, what does it say, visitor's center. Um, so this is along the trail or along the peninsula um, if you wanted to stop and get some more, um, like, serious historical data. Um, along the Cape Peninsula, they also have a, a wide variety, uh, a pretty sizable number of penguins. Um, these that have like the, the black um, round thing under the chin, um, sometimes they're called um, chin strap penguins. <laughs> In South Africa, they call them jackass penguins for the noise they make. They sound like donkey's brain. And so um, they were, with it, when they got going, they were pretty loud. Um, but there were tons of them. And they used to live off coast on this island until the, the colonizers, and I don't remember if it was the British or the Dutch, who decided that the guano was really valuable. And so they went and scraped the beaches on that island. And then the penguins couldn't live there anymore because they had destroyed the habitat. So they relocated them to the peninsula itself. And so um, now they're outside of Cape Town. And all of that seaweed is really freaky. It looks like snakes. <laughs> we also went to the Kirsten Bosch Botanical Gardens. These are Egyptian geese that just kind of wandered around picking up stuff. Um, there's Kurt Field. And behind him, you can see uh, Table Mountain with the tablecloth coming in. Um, but Kirsten Bosch was really gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And um, if you guys remember when um, Franny talked about South Africa, she mentioned going to the botanical gardens. She was spot on. This was amazing. Um, so the, the Finbos is the national flower of South Africa. And here's a closer up one. They kind of look like 
artichokes to me, <laughs> but mm -hmm. really pretty flowers. Um, diversity was just amazing. Um, this is in fact that yellow flower that when you make it wet, it turns into the soapy feel. <laughs> um, more of the guinea fowl, um, some beautiful plants. Everything was nicely, these are orchids, um, everything was nicely labeled and described and they had some gorgeous sculptures out of the um, um, fossilized trees. What are, what am I looking for? Petrified. Um, petrified wood, yeah. So um, really, really neat. And then all of the plants that are no longer living. They had like a graveyard for extinct plants as a reminder that once they're gone, they're gone. And so um, it's up to us to preserve these plants. The pineapple flower, I would like to see if that would grow in Illinois. <laughs> but, um, stingy nettles, this was like a little taste of home. The tree on the left is an oak tree. It is not native to South Africa. It was brought in by, you know, those pesky colonizers and kind of took over some of the, the territory of native plants. Um, but some of them are just so big and pretty that they haven't cut them down. And then the one on the right, of course, is stingy nettles. Ours don't have spots on them, but they are everywhere in Illinois. Um, another carving out of stone this time, um, the big yellow wood tree. And if you look in the grass, um, the other reason I took this picture was because it's full of moles. <laughs> we have tons of moles in our house. So Table Mountain is so called because it looks like a tablecloth coming over the mm -hmm. side of the, the ledge up here. And um, so we rode, this is the view from, behind, you know, from the car as it's going up. And as we got up there, we were kind of like, oh no, the fog's coming in. We're not gonna be able to see anything. The day we were there, it was so strange because it looked like it would come in and this is where we're headed up to the top. And so we get there and it looks like it's gonna come in and it's all gonna be done. We're gonna have to get down. No, nope, not quite. <laughs> so um, this is like the concession stand and souvenir shop, um, but it looks like it's coming in again. And then it looks like it's going out <laughs> and then <laughs> looks like it's coming in again. Yeah. And you could see it coming over the, the top when we were up there, it was really neat. And then the rainbow came out and the, the trails got a little misty and, and we thought, oh, they're gonna tell us we don't have to go down. But then it cleared. <laughs> so <laughs> it was really a strange day, but it was beautiful, absolutely amazing and beautiful. So when we got back down, um, we took pictures with um, Betsy and Kurt Field. And this is the degrees of where Table Mountain is and Table Mountain in the background. Uh, we also went to a couple different wineries while we were there. And if we were in person tonight, we would be enjoying some of that wine. <laughs> I'll save it for next time. Um, but the wineries are done up for tourists. Um, the wine is delicious, by the way. But, you know, the, the grounds are well kept. It's beautiful. Um, you know, it's a big business. Um, but it is, um, it is really geared toward getting everybody excited about what they do for, mm -hmm. for wine. Um, this is inside the um, original house of the, the winery here and of course the red grapes on the right. Um, the wine, uh, what do you want to call this, where they take the, the grapes to be the, the big, the real crushing place. The one on the left is for show, um, then they have the big steel um, great crushing things on the inside. Um, and one of the original homesteads of the owners of this winery. So just beautiful. And then in um, Stolenbach, this is, um, I took a picture, I have no idea other than it says, we college, I don't know, <laughs> OU college. Um, it turns out that Stolenbush rather, um, Bradley has an exchange program in Stolenbush, South Africa. And so I said, Ooh, can I go teach there? <laughs> because <laughs> I would go again and, and go do some touring. It'd be great. Um, but I also thought the art was just really fun. Yeah. So um, this is another old press. And, and can you imagine what it could press? Uh, we also visited a distillery. Van Rijn's um, had some really, really good brandy that we all 
Um, I hope everybody tried some of it at yes. least. Again, they had another wine press, um, but the um, two signs on the way in the door, I thought said it all. So to make a good quality brandy, you first need good quality grapes. <laughs> but then the quote from Samuel Johnson, Claret is the liquor for boys, port for men, but he who aspires to be a hero must drink brandy. <laughs> so, um, and it, it, we, you know, we toured and they had some of these old things, you know, the how many times has it been distilled and, you know, like if you're out in the bush, you could still make your own stuff if you wanted to. Um, and then we sampled and the, the least expensive stuff, I will tell you, I would never drink again. But the most expensive stuff, we bought a bottle. Okay. <laughs> it was really good. It was very smooth. And then in between, you're supposed to eat these chocolates. <laughs> so it was quite delicious. Or there was some juice you could cleanse your palate with as well. And then the last thing we did in um, Cape Town, well, it wasn't the last thing, second to last. Um, we went to the waterfront and, you know, big mall, lots of places to shop. Um, one of my friends had just bought an espresso machine. And so I said, do you want me to shop for some of the pods? If you don't know Nespresso, it's, it's like the Keurig, but they're round. Mm -hmm. And there's like, you know, hundreds of different varieties. So um, these are also at the waterfront, the clock tower. And then we, um, I took a picture of the sign that explains why it's so significant. Mm -hmm. It's a tidal gauge. Um, Sean, made this thing work. You pedaled it like a bicycle and it flipped it around. It was kind of fun. And so um, this is like the, the hotel and all of the restaurants. The mall is the lower part on the left, um, but there was like a big hotel you could stay in down there. They also had, you know, the South African Navy had a ship there. Um, this is some kind of a, you know, um, like a tourist thing. But if you'll note what it's called, Madiba, and remember, that's what the African people called Nelson Mandela. It was their, you know, kind of pet name for him. And so yes. this, is, this is their pet name for their ship. Um, this stadium is where the, the World Cup was held um, in South Africa a few years ago. Um, and then we went to Robben Island. And mm -hmm. this was a bit depressing. <laughs> so Robben Island, as you know, is where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned. But he's actually not the only president of South Africa who was imprisoned at Robben Island. Um, so both um, Matlante Mat and Zuma were both now, or were both imprisoned. Ironically and quite sadly, um, Jacob Zuma is going back to prison um, mm -hmm. for corruption, racketeering, fraud, and money laundering. Mm -hmm. um, but we took the ferry out to Robben Island, and I, I wasn't sure what I expected, but it wasn't the look of a town. Um, when you think about it, it makes total sense. People lived there who tended the prisoners, and, um, but nobody's going to get close to the island because it's got these, these you know, barricades that unless you, yeah, breakwaters, unless you've been invited, um, you have to steer around them very carefully. So in the time it takes you to steer around them, and of course it, it also um, keeps the, the tide from wiping out the island, um, but unless you've been invited, you can easily be repelled by the time it takes you to get around them. Um, but these are the doors that take you to the prison, and it doesn't say, mm -hmm. you know, work will make you free. But I have to tell you, that's immediately what I thought. <laughs> so it just reminded me of Auschwitz and um, made me very sad. Um, but this, you know, um, a variety of prisoners were kept on Robben Island, including um, those who were Muslim. And so this is a mosque that is built for the people who um, worshipped. Uh, there's, there are other churches. It was also defended, uh, make sure nobody breaks in to, to free those prisoners. Um, people died. This is, however, not the prisoners cemetery. These are the guards and their families cemetery. Um, the prisoners were typically um, put in common graves or graves with a simple um, marker. They were not distinguished otherwise. So this building looks quite nice. Um, it is where the guard dogs were housed. Mm. So 
The guard dogs had it pretty good by comparison to the prisoners. This is the quarry where Nelson Mandela, um, his vision was greatly impaired by the glare off the, the limestone. Um, again, uh, a Christian church um, for those who, who worship there. This building was built in the early 1600s. Um, this Robin Island was always used as a, a prison. Um, so the Dutch used it first for regular prisoners. And then um, the South African government under uh, Botha and, and others used it for the apartheid political prisoners. Um, but again, you know, the picture on the, the right are, you know, the camp guards and their families. Um, this is the commandant's house. Quite mm. nice. Um, there are also penguins there. Um, mm. And again, they are endangered. And so they did ask that nobody go and, and um, play with them. These are not penguins, by the way. These are... Um, the, the gulls or whatever the gulls and i forgot to look up the name of them but yeah um but again you know heavy fortifications nobody gets in nobody gets out f section is where nelson mandela was imprisoned and you know the empty room with the the bed on the end um this is for the tourists but in the day when these were regular prison halls um those bunk beds would be all over the place. And this fellow who led our tour at Robin Island is a former prisoner. And so mm -hmm. um, I don't remember how many years he spent there, um, but he had, you know, some keen insights. And he said, you know, when they opened this place as a museum, they asked for former prisoners to come and tell people the truth, to tell people how it really was, but most of them could not do it. And he said, you know, it, for the first several times that he led a tour, um, he would break down and, and not be able to finish the tour and somebody else would have to finish it. Um, if you were a regular prisoner who was there for whatever crimes, you might get the cell on the right. Notice that it has a mattress and a bed. If you were Nelson Mandela or a political prisoner, you probably got a cell on the left. Mm which is the pad on the floor. Um, if you've seen the movie, uh, you know that they, the political prisoners in particular were spaced out in this space, breaking down rocks into gravel. That was their punishment. Um, and this is Nelson Mandela on the, the side here. These are um, scenes that are in this area complaining about this. And political prisoners like Nelson Mandela um, were also you know, abused in other ways. They were given short pants, which just was culturally rude. Instead of giving them long pants like men would wear, they gave short pants like boys would wear. Um, this is a, 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 a tower. This is actually Nelson Mandela's um, cell. And so his bathroom in the corner, his pad on the floor, um, they, the, our guide also described how um, there were injustices at every turn. And so, you know, main showers, but you would, you would shower in there with dozens of other men, not just a few at a time, but, you know, again, to demoralize you and abuse you. Um, the bathrooms, um, there were only a few. And so you really had to time your needs carefully because you weren't allowed to like wait in line. You had to take care of your business and get out of there. Um, he also ran us through some of the other, you know, things that they did. They censored the mail. Um, oh, I guess you have to look at the picture behind him. So this is a letter and the censors decided what could be received by the inmate and they just cut stuff out, literally like took a scissors and cut out what they didn't want the inmate to see. Um, and then you also had, you know, the, the reception office and the court and, you know, whatever rules they decided you break, you broke, then they would give you punishment for that. <coughs> uh, you had to apply for the privilege of studying and very few were given that privilege. Um, as you know, Nelson Mandela wrote a great deal from prison um, and, and, 
you know, but he was in um, Robben Island until um, 82. He spent 18 years at Robben Island and then uh, Polson for another six. And then uh, I can't remember the third one, Victor something for uh, until he was finally released in 94. So um, in all some 27 years he spent in prisons. So um, District 6 is the last place that we visited. Um, this was also a, a major element of the apartheid era. District 6 got its name quite, you know, um, innocently because it was the sixth district of Cape Town as Cape Town was growing up in the in the 1800s. Um, it was a very dynamic area. It had a lot, um, South Africa got rid of slavery in 1833, so a lot of former slaves settled in this area. Um, again, colored um, people, you know, of a wide variety. And so, you know, they were mixed race, um, Malay Indians. There were some Afrikaners um, and there were some white people who lived there, small, small numbers. Um, but it was a thriving community with artisans, musicians, um, you know, restaurants, families, churches. You know, it was, it was quite a cosmopolitan kind of area um, until <laughs> after the 1948 election, uh, the new government passed the Group Areas Act, and it is what determined what kind of an area all of the existing areas of Cape Town were going to be. And District 6, because it was close to the commercial center of town, uh, because it was a thriving community <laughs> with established businesses and, and nice houses and, you know, et cetera, um, it had to be cleared of all the colored and black people. Um, one of the rules, by the way, um, when we were at Robin Island, our guide was talking about when she was in school, one of the ways that they determined your color was the comb test. And so they would, or the pencil test rather, it was the pencil test. So they would take a pencil and stick it in your hair right here. And if it stuck, you were colored. If your skin was light, if you were black, you were black. But, you know, if you were trying to pass yourself off as anything other than black and the pencil stuck in your hair, you were considered colored. And in South Africa at the time, white people had all the rights and privileges. Black people actually had some rights and privileges. Colored people had the least amount of rights and privileges of all. And so if you were called colored, that wasn't necessarily, um, well, I'm, at least I'm not black it was actually worse than being black. So, um, but all of the people, um, all of the coloreds, all of the blacks had to move out of District 6 and it was um, now going to be whites only. Um, it was not until um, the, the end of apartheid that they began to rebuild some of the buildings that had been bulldozed, um, you know, you took what you could carry because you were told you have to be out in two hours. Um, and um, it's not until Nelson Mandela comes around that they begin to rebuild and people are able to reclaim some of their, um, their territory, if you will. Um, but, you know, some of these suitcases represent what you were able to carry. So, you know, if you have to get out in two hours, you're not gonna be able to load up your furniture. You're gonna put what you can in your suitcase you know, your photographs, your personal stuff, the things you consider the most valuable and, and go. Um, so these suitcases represent what people put in their suitcases to leave. And again, it made me very sad and made me think about, you know, the Holocaust era when Jewish people were rounded up, basically, you know, told whatever you can carry, show up at the train station. Of course, you know, they were put on trains and, and sent into camps for the people of District 6, they were shuffled off into the wastelands of the Cape Flats. Um, so, but, you know, the houses before they were emptied, you know, these people lived quite comfortably, you know, nice, clean kept houses. 
Um, some of this, the, the museum is actually in an old Methodist church. And so um, some of the stuff was written on the walls and they kept it. Um, other things, people would make these um, needlepoint, you know, how we have like the pillows and stuff. They wrote their recipes so that everybody would always remember the recipes of District 6. And so, um, you know, so there were a whole bunch of these at the museum. They were pretty neat. Um, I've looked at some of them and I think, I'm not sure I'd make that, but, <laughs> but nonetheless, um, you know, my mother made this dish on cold winter days, you know, um, kind of cool stuff, you know. Um, and then these are downtown. So District 6, we walked from District 6 to uh, back to our hotel and passed by um, the, the Parliament building, the you know, City Hall, if you will, and this monument to um, Robert Scott, who their group perished trying to hit the South Pole. 